This is americasdemocrats.org, the weekly netcast for stand-up Democrats. I'm your host, Jim Cuddy. Journalist and commentator David K. Johnston says it's the government that's largely responsible for the income inequality plaguing the economy. Health professor Dan Zaberi reveals the shocking cost in both money and lives caused by hospitals outsourcing their non-medical jobs. And Bill Press talks with retiring Congressman George Miller of California. Are you tired of Tea Party Republicans and Rush Limbaugh dominating the airwaves? Do you want the facts you won't get on Fox or even on CNN? Then stay tuned. Our sponsor, 21st Century Democrats, works hard to get everyday Democrats involved in returning our party to its roots and to success at the ballot box. Sit back and listen, then stand up and fight. And follow 21st Century Democrats on Facebook for all the latest progressive news. We're glad you can join us. Award-winning journalist and author David K. Johnston reveals how Republicans don't support market capitalism, but engage in corporate socialism instead by redistributing wealth from the many to the few. And we welcome to the program David K. Johnston, an investigative journalist and author, specialist in economics and tax issues, winner of the 2001 Pulitzer Prize for Beat Reporting, and the editor of a new book called Divided, The Perils of Growing Inequality. David K. Johnston, thank you so much for joining us today on AmericasDemocrats.org. Well, thank you for having me, Jim. I only wish the Republicans would also have me. And, and I know that you would be willing to speak with them, correct? Oh, Absolutely. All right. Well, so to any of our Republican friends out there, David K. Johnson is ready when you are. Um, Now, we recently heard a report that 85 individuals have more wealth than three and a half billion people on planet Earth. Is that a valid or meaningful statistic? Oh, I think it's incredibly meaningful. Uh, because it tells us how totally distorted our world economy has become. And even here in the United States, where, uh, you know, people generally are a lot better off than in many other parts of the world, a handful of people uh, have the same wealth as the bottom 50% of Americans, because the bottom 50% of Americans basically have no wealth. And the bottom 90% of Americans have a tiny fraction of the wealth. Uh, The bottom... uh, Two-fifths of Americans, that's um, in round numbers 120 million people, together own three-tenths of one percent of the wealth in this country. Three-tenths of one percent. So uh, I think it's very significant, and we would be wealthier and better off if we had a broader distribution. And why do we have these intense concentrations of wealth? Well, sometimes it's because somebody invented a better mousetrap. But usually government policy is involved. Monopolies. Look at the Forbes 400 list. Three or four of the names in the first 100 are in the pipeline business. That's a government grant of a monopoly. And I've exposed how that industry got itself exempted from the corporate income tax, but forces you to pay at the corporate income tax, which inflates their profits by as much as 75%. Well, If you could earn 75% above the already rich profit margin we give a utility, of course you're going to be very wealthy, and that means the rest of us are going to be worse off. Mm -hmm. And so government policy is is very crucial to this disparity of income. I understood back in 1980, and I wasn't covering these issues then, I was writing about the, uh, the incompetence and the brutality and the spying of the LAPD back in those days and for the LA Times, But I understood perfectly well the message that Ronald Reagan had in his 1980 campaign. And his message was, as people heard it, we'll all be better off when we get rid of these shackles the Democrats and the New Deal have put on us. But if you listen carefully, what he said was, the very wealthy will become much wealthier. That was the core of his message. That's why the very wealthy who benefit from government policies love Ronald Reagan. I mean, John Elway, the the football player, Mm-hmm. He was on Fox News the other night, uh, the night of the Super Bowl, saying that the reason he's a Republican is he doesn't believe in safety nets. This is a man who played football in a taxpayer-provided stadium with all sorts of huge taxpayer subsidies and is part of an industry that is now trying to get the taxpayers to pick up the vast majority of the cost for the lifelong injuries, especially brain injuries, of football players. Doesn't believe in a safety net? Holy mackerel, would that most Americans had the safety net that uh, John Elway has. 
Well, that's just it. I mean, in 10 years when he's in a diaper and, and drooling uncontrollably because of the, the, the head traumas that he suffered throughout his career, he's covered. He's fine. He's, he's got enough money to, to – that is his safety net. But where, where, what about everybody else, right? Well, and, and, but it's important that the reason he has that money is that it was subtly transferred from the taxpayers to the NFL. I mean, if, if the billionaires who own football teams and baseball teams and, 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 uh, and other sports franchises built their own stadiums with their own money, that would be one thing. But 80% of the cost of the new stadiums is coming from the taxpayers. And that's, by the way, the 80% we can prove. Uh, government often, when giving money to wealthy people, argues that it's proprietary and confidential and won't let you see the detailed contracts. Um, George W. Bush, he, the supposed champion of markets, he started out in life as an oil shelter tax salesman, trying to make a living off the tax system. And that is a business that requires two fundamental skills, an incredible attention to detail and a deep understanding of how to read both the tax code and the geologic reports on land. I know you'll be shocked to hear that George W. Bush was a failure as a tax shelter salesman. Um, <laughs> then he goes into baseball, and the subsidy that his team, the Texas Rangers, got, according to a Republican, the husband of Kay Bailey Hutchison, uh, and he is the leading authority in Texas on municipal bonds, and he was involved in this deal. According to him, the subsidy was $202.5 million. I had calculated $202 million, and he corrected me. And the team's increased price when it was sold was $168 million. So George Bush's fortune, about 90% of which the public record shows is from that baseball team, came entirely from the taxpayers, and he wasn't even capable of grasping the entire subsidy. He left $38 million plus on the table. But this is how many of the great fortunes are being made. Dick Cheney in the 2008 election and George W. Bush went both to two different, so a total of four visits, Cabela's stores. They sell, uh, you know, hunting and fishing gear. Right. And Cheney called it the greatest store in the world. Well, in my book, Free Lunch, I show that, that the Cabela's chain earned a dollar and thirty-seven cents in taxpayer subsidies for every dollar of profit they reported. And since most of their profit came from their catalogs, their retail stores were overwhelmingly built this way. Down in the Tri-Cities area where Bristol, Tennessee, and Johnson City uh, and Kingsport are, one of the mayors is boasting about how they gave $25 million to Johnny Morris, a competitor, to build a Bass Pro. That's how Bass Pros are built, with tax dollars. So Johnny Morris, a very wealthy man, because the taxpayers are giving him his money. This is, the Republicans are not supporting market economics and market capitalism. They are creating a system and embedding it in, in law of corporate socialism, in which capitalists get their capital from the taxpayers, in which you know 90% of Walmart distribution centers, a third roughly of Walmart stores, and the stores of many other companies, Home Depot, Lowe's, uh, uh, staples, uh, in some cases entire shopping centers, are built with tax dollars diverted from the police and the fire department and the libraries and the schools. That's one of the reasons we're in such horrible economic trouble. And I've detailed this in my books. Nobody's ever shown anything wrong with my books because I take them all from the public record. I go get the actual, dig out these records. And, and the, the Republicans right now are trying very hard to cut the government collection of statistical data which is crucial to economic growth. And they have no interest in spending money to collect data on welfare for the rich, but boy, do they go nuts when they find some, you know, 0.000001% misuse of money by poor people. We're speaking with David K. Johnston, uh, editor of the new book called Divided, The Perils of Our Growing Inequality. David, how important is raising the minimum wage? And should Democrats give up trying to get Congress to raise the minimum wage and concentrate the effort state by state, which the president alluded to in his State of the Union address? Well, let me reframe the issue. I don't think we're talking about raising the minimum wage. We're talking about restoring the minimum wage. When I was a minimum wage worker in the 1960s, the minimum wage was more than $10 an hour. In fact, I believe at the peak it was closer to $11 an hour. We've cut the minimum wage. Uh, in a number of states, like Alabama, there is no minimum wage. 
And for restaurant workers, the minimum wage has been stuck, thanks to Herman Cain, at about $2.15 an hour. Anything you get above that has to come from tips. And so we need to reframe that debate. I think that the, this is an issue that the Democrats should make a lot of noise about, and so should the moderate Republicans, because it's only a narrow segment of the Republicans who post this. Surveys show that a majority of registered Republicans favor raising, because that's how the question is raised, the minimum wage. I'd love to see what would happen if they talked about restoring it to the level of almost 50 years ago. Uh, we, we need to raise this because... It's costing us money elsewhere. There is no, no free lunch, uh, to cite the title of my book. Uh, Walmart stores in Wisconsin cost the taxpayers for welfare services for Walmart workers a lot of money. McDonald's put out, you remember, a brochure, which they've since withdrawn, telling their employees how to apply for food stamps and how to get a second job where they could work 80 hours a week, uh, and then it suggested they could afford $20 a month for health care. Um, this is is a, driving down the overall economic growth in this country. It is subtly redistributing income to a narrow class of business owners, and we are the only country in the modern world with massive child poverty and worse, extreme child poverty. That's children growing up in households with less than half the threshold to hit your, for your household to be out of the poverty level. And I say this from Rochester, New York, one of the richest cities in history. You know, um, Kodak, uh, Xerox, uh, Bosch & Lomb, a Railway Signal, Western Union, all these huge industries that were created here. A community with, even though Forbes doesn't recognize any of them, a whole bunch of billionaires living in the suburbs. And yet the city is the fifth poorest in America. It has, the, I believe, the second worst concentration of child poverty in the metropolitan area around here, of extreme child poverty. This is not good for us. This is not good for economic growth, social stability, or your personal safety. And would lifting more people into the middle class, or actually how would lifting more people into the middle class, also improve the nation's overall health care system? Oh, well, absolutely. One of the things in Divided where you take a very broad look at inequality, this is not just about money, we talk about health care, environmental hazards, education, family status, a whole broad range of issues with people from, uh, from Plutarch and Plato to Senator Elizabeth Warren. Uh, when you have higher incomes, adequate incomes, you have less high blood pressure, which is a silent, inexpensive killer that leads to debilitating chronic diseases, uh, like kidney failure that cost a lot to treat, and we know how to keep people alive for decades after they've had that. Um, uh, uh, congestive heart failure. We're soon going to be able to keep people alive, not the historic five years, but 20 years if they have uh, congestive heart failure. They're not going to be able to work. They're not going to be productive, but we'll keep them alive, and they will live hmm. miserable lives for 15 additional years. So, yes, a better standard of living would make us better off, and... and None of our competitors are like this. They're doing just fine. You know, if you don't believe that, get on a plane and go to Europe. Walk into the train stations and notice they don't have buckets out to catch the water when the, when the rain falls. They don't have holes in the ceiling and, and rusting uh, support structures like we do. Drive on their freeways. They don't have potholes. My wife and I once spent three days trying to find a pothole in Stockholm. Couldn't find one. People thought it was laughable that we would think there even one existed, and they have much worse weather than most of America. Um, they don't. You have an have... odd way of spending a vacation. I just want to say. Well, <laughs> yes, I, I, we 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 did stop here and there to enjoy other things, but everywhere we were okay, driving, good. we were looking and asking. <laughs> and and you know, we we did that because when we arrived in Stockholm for a, a book I was researching, I said to my wife, you know, Fresh Limbaugh is right. We're going to enter a city here because this is the highest tax country in the world where people are walking around in tattered clothes. The buildings are falling apart. There's no goods for sale. The cars are all beaters, and the streets are falling apart. And anybody who's been to Stockholm knows that the streets are in great shape. The stores are full of people and goods with things to sell. It's hard to get a seat at a restaurant because uh, cause so many people are out eating. Uh, it's full of nice new cars, including Cadillac Escalades, that in a place where gasoline is $11 a gallon. And 
shows that, that not only is, is someone like Limbaugh completely wrong about the tax system, but, you know, I talked to 12 bus drivers who were waiting for the tourists down in what's called Old Town and learned that all these bus drivers who had retired from other jobs and then either went back to work because they needed more money or they were bored owned two houses free and clear, all 12 of them, two homes, a, a city home and a country home, free and clear. What do you think the odds are, Jim, we could go out on a street corner in Washington, D.C., find a dozen bus drivers, and one of them would own one house free and clear? Uh, yeah, I mean, that's, wow. Yeah. That's going to be yeah. a low percentage. And, yeah, and 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 you don't you know the 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 uh, the wealthiest person in the world at one time not too many years ago was a Swede several times actually the wealthiest person in the world has been a Swede. When we raise the standard of living of all people, those people who own capital assets have more. But what we've done with our current low tax policies is we've encouraged the owners of businesses to withdraw capital from their business and spend it on their lifestyle. And the result is you reduce jobs. When you withdraw capital from a business, you are inherently, over time, reducing jobs. So we've seen the, the, the prices of art go through the roof. Does a Modigliani 1917 painting add to, to economic output? No, not one bit. But when somebody takes... $85 million plus the taxes, so that's $100 million out of their business to, this is when we had 15% dividend under Bush, to buy that painting. What we're doing is destroying jobs so somebody can have this lovely piece of art hanging in their home. That's crazy economic policy. Just crazy. We're speaking with David K. Johnson. And David, before we let you go, is this just the case that the rich aren't just lucky or even meritorious, they just make sure that the political economy is bent in their direction at the expense of the poor. I mean, is that how we sum this up? Well, just remember, the rich are no more monolithic than black Americans, Catholic Americans, uh, parents, or anybody else. There's a wide divergence among wealthy people, and many of my best sources are very wealthy people, uh, some of whom own their own jets and who are conservative Republicans, but who understand what's gone wrong. Uh, but the, the fundamental problem is that we have put in place government rules that subtly take money from the many and redistribute to the few. And the Bible, which almost every politician who runs for office will cite as uh, something they rely on, at least the Old Testament, uh, it has the word for us to describe taking from the widow to give to the rich man. Evil. Well put. Uh, David K. Johnson, investigative journalist, author, specialist in economics and tax issues, winner of the 2001 Pulitzer Prize for Beat Reporting. He is the editor of a new book called Divided, the Perils of Our Growing Inequality. David, as always, we appreciate your time with us today on americasdemocrats.org. Look forward to having you back again soon. Thank you. All right. And this is americasdemocrats.org, the weekly netcast for Stand Up Democrats. We want you to sit back and listen, but we need you to stand up and fight. Do you want to get involved and help get our party back to its roots and to success at the ballot box? You can make your contribution to Democrats for America's future and help us keep this show going and to elect Democrats who will stand up for Democratic principles. Go to americasdemocrats.org and click on Donate at the top of the page. This is americasdemocrats.org, the weekly netcast for stand-up Democrats. Healthcare analyst Dan Zuberi says a frightening number of people in U.S. and Canadian hospitals are at risk of illness and death just because the hospital support staff is outsourced. And we'll hear from him on that in just a moment. Right now, we turn to Jim Hightower, America's number one populist, for his common sense commentary. Were you invited to the big doings in Davos? You know, the annual powwow of power elites held in that posh resort town in the Swiss Alps. The World Economic Forum, as it's formerly called, brings together a bunch of corporate chieftains, the heads of state from various countries, an A-list of entertainment sparklies, and a horde of economists, consultants, and lesser politicos trying to get noticed. The theme of this year's Wine, Dine, and Shine show was the reshaping of the world. How modest is that? But you can't expect modesty from an event that's been dubbed, quote, a velvet rope club for the 1% of the 1%. Or, as the mayor of London once put it, a constellation of egos involved in massive mutual orgies of adulation. 
Maybe that's why the big news from Davos this year was not who attended, but the platinum-level biggies who spurned the invite, such as Warren Buffett, along with the honchos of Apple, Facebook, and Google. It seems that many are put off by the declining level of speakers and panelists. As if to emphasize that decline, the forum organizers even brought in Governor Rick Oops Perry of Texas to be on a health care panel. Now that's industrial strength chutzpah. After 14 years as governor, Perry's state still has a fourth of its people with no health insurance, the ugliest performance of all 50 states. Indeed, if Davos attendees need an example of how a public official who enjoys government-paid health care can so crassly deny any coverage to millions of the less fortunate, Perry's their man. This is Jim Hightower saying, adding to the forum's unintended satire of elites without a clue, A major sub-theme this year was how to address economic inequality. One way would be to invite at least one person who's on the receiving end of inequality. Maybe one of Rick Perry's uninsured constituents. Need an antidote to the progressive blues? Want some good news about how grassroots folks are rebelling against the corporate powers and winning? Well, here's an easy-to-swallow pill for you, the Hightower Lowdown. Hightower's monthly newsletter will give you the lowdown, even as it lifts you up. It's four pages a month, jam-packed with facts you can use, actions you can take, and Jim's own Texas humor, all for only $15 a year. To become a lowdowner, go to HightowerLowdown.org. This is AmericasDemocrats.org, the weekly netcast for stand-up Democrats. If hospitals would spend a little more money paying their own employees instead of outsourcing for the cheapest support workers, they would save money by cutting down on costly hospital infections. That's the analysis from health professor Dan Zuberi. And joining us now on AmericasDemocrats.org, the weekly netcast for stand-up Democrats, Dan Zuberi is associate professor of social policy at the University of Toronto and the author of a new book called Cleaning Up, How Hospital Outsourcing is Hurting Workers and Endangering Patients. Dan Zuberi, thank you so much for joining us today on AmericasDemocrats.org. Thank you for having me. Uh, you're quite welcome. I gotta say, the book looks like an expose. What caused you to look into the problem of outsourcing? When I was living in Vancouver, a newly elected right of center government passed legislation in 2003 that resulted in the outsourcing of hospital support work in the entire southwest region of the province. Literally 8,500 unionized hospital cleaners, dietary aides, and other support workers received pink slips overnight and found out that their jobs are now being replaced by contract workers who work for three major multinational corporations. As someone interested in low-wage work and poverty, I wanted to learn more about the consequences of this outsourcing for these workers, their families, and communities, as well as hospitals and the healthcare system. So my research team and I completed in-depth interviews with 70 hospital support workers and 26 physicians, nurses, and infection control experts, um, as well as taking a look behind the scenes at hospitals um, as workplaces and completing observation research as a, at a few hospitals as well. So what kinds of hospital jobs are outsourced and why are they outsourced? My book focuses on hospital cleaners and food service workers. Some hospital administrators have the idea that these workers are not part of the core functioning of hospitals, in that these workers, say, aren't doing surgery, for example. In most cases, these jobs are contracted out with the goal explicitly to save money. In practice, it often doesn't work out that way, but I can talk more about that later. Um, First, what happens to the jobs is that when they're outsourced to these multinational corporations, um, basically decent jobs that pay family-sustaining wages, in this case around $18 per hour and had pretty good job benefits, immediately transformed into what we might call MIC jobs, jobs that pay a little bit above the minimum wage, in this case $9.50 per hour, and only provide the basic minimal um, benefits. Given the high cost of living in Vancouver, those workers who continued to work in these jobs suffered major hardships as they began to have to live paycheck to paycheck and struggle to make ends meet. Well, that sounds hauntingly familiar around here, too. Um, (laughs) You know, we're speaking with Dan Zuberi, Associate Professor of Social Policy at the University of Toronto, and his new book is called Cleaning Up, How Hospital Outsourcing is Hurting Workers and Endangering Patients. We know that hospital-acquired infections are a huge problem in in our health system. How does outsourcing hospital work contribute to that? In the course of my research, I was shocked to learn about the seriousness of the challenge of hospital-acquired infections of which many more are becoming resistant to antibiotics. 
and more difficult to treat. It is truly a frightening scenario. In the U.S., 1.8 million people are infected every year, and an estimated 99,000 people die. Healthcare associated infections have become the fourth leading cause of death in America. One scholar noted that Amer- more Americans die every year from healthcare associated infections than AIDS, breast cancer, and auto accidents combined. The direct treatment costs of hospital-acquired infections have been estimated by the U.S. Centers for Disease Control to be somewhere in the neighborhood of 30 to $35 billion a year, and a, a recent estimate of the total annual cost of infections published in the Journal of Medical Economics puts, puts the cost at between $96 and $147 billion per year. Infection control experts, on the other hand, estimate that between 30 and 50 percent of infections are preventable. So it's no wonder that the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services has made reducing hospital-acquired infections a top priority. What I argue is that the cleanliness of the hospital environment is one of the most important factors for reducing the rate of hospital-acquired infections. I argue that having a highly trained and professionalized support service staff also creates the conditions for safe work practices that minimizes the spread of pathogens throughout the hospital environment. Environmental contamination is one of many causes of hospital-acquired infections, which also include things like the um, inappropriate and overprescription of antibiotics, um, overcrowding, hand washing, lack of hand washing, and um, poor hospital design. It's a billion-dollar problem. I mean, that is astounding. Well, more than a billion-dollar problem. Yeah. Wow. Um, you examined hospitals in both Canada and the United States. For our U.S. listeners... What were your other major findings? And is the practice better or worse in the U.S. than in Canada? This is a good question with a somewhat complicated answer. In the past few years, the U.S. has taken a few major policy steps in the right direction in terms of reducing hospital-acquired infections. I feel Canada is a little bit slower off the mark, but there is growing attention here to the issue. When it comes to hospital support jobs, most hospitals in Canada continue to use an in-house, unionized cleaning and support staff. The outsourcing trend as a short-sighted attempt to save money right now is restricted to mostly southwestern British Columbia, um, Alberta, and um, some parts of the province of Ontario. But it is spreading. It is a growing trend. In the U.S., many hospitals, whether they outsource these jobs or not, provide workers who occupy these positions very low wages and benefits um, and so, so the problem there is pretty, pretty ubiquitous. Um, overall, the infection rates and threat of acquiring an infection as a patient remains far too high in both countries, with estimates ranging from between 5 to 10 percent of patients infected. Personally, I guess I voted with my feet, so to speak, and my sense of the quality of care overall in terms of medical treatment in the hospital is similar in both countries, perhaps with more variants in the, the U.S. in terms of quality. Um, the biggest difference in, is that in Canada, you don't have to worry about getting a bill from the hospital for your treatment or care, and I literally mean no bill at all, except maybe for parking. So all in all, the Canadian single-payer single system is much more efficient, cost-effective, and socially just, but we need to do more to address the, the infection challenge. I hope everybody was listening closely when when Dan mentioned you don't receive the bill. That's a <laughs> health health care for everybody, people. Um, wouldn't putting an end to the use of contractors raise medical costs even more, though? I mean, I mean, especially in the United States. This can definitely seem like a potential challenge on the surface. But when it comes to infection control, as with many other progressive policies, spending a little bit more today saves way more money in the future. Um, treating hospital-acquired infections is incredibly expensive, twenty dollars to $25,000 per infection on average. Um, so I think we have to ask ourselves, did it cost more for manufacturers to have to install seatbelts in cars for us to use or to mandate that, to inspect food before it's sold? Absolutely. But we support these measures because they improve safety and they save lives. The actual costs of paying workers a family-sustaining living wage and providing decent benefits are often a lot lower than many might estimate. Research on low-wage work in retail and other sectors has found major cost savings um, from paying decent wages and benefits, largely because it reduces employee turnover, which saves a fortune on training expenses for training new employees. Um, At the same time, experienced workers can often complete more tasks and work more effectively and efficiently than than new hires who are still trying to figure things out. So these low-skilled jobs, especially things in cleaning, require a fair amount of skills to to do well. Um, One U.K. study found that just adding one additional cleaner resulted in fewer MRSA infections, but cleaners and other hospital support workers remain at the bottom of the hospital employment hierarchy. These jobs are often held by women and minorities, and so the importance of their work is often undervalued, making them easy targets for cost-saving and outsourcing. 
Again, we're speaking with Dan Zuberi, Associate Professor of Social Policy at the University of Toronto, uh, author of a new book called Cleaning Up, How Hospital Outsourcing is Hurting Workers and Endangering Patients. What solutions, Dan, are there to this problem? The good news is that pressure and action to reduce hospital-acquired infections works. The U.S. federal government, as I mentioned earlier, has done a lot to ramp up pressure on hospitals to reduce infection rates, including mandating reporting infections and refusing to pay for the treatment of these infections. Hospitals have brought in hand-washing campaigns, adopted surgery checklists, and improved antibiotic stewardship programs. When the U.K. mass outsourced all of their hospital support jobs in the 1990s, they also experienced skyrocketing infection rates, and massive media and public pressure in that case resulted in a series of reforms, including deep cleans of hospitals and reworking the contract tendering process so that all corporations bidding for contracts had to pay workers the prevailing wage for those working in cleaning and other support jobs. Um, In the U.K., Scotland actually went further and banned further outsourcing of these support jobs, and many hospitals in the U.K. have brought these jobs back in-house. Since then, infection rates have declined, and we see many examples of hospitals reducing hospital-acquired infection rates. It definitely takes a multi-pronged effort of which improved environmental sanitation and safe work practices by all those working in the hospital are an important component. Hospitals in the medical system need to live up to their vow to do no harm to do no harm, and they need to take that vow seriously. And I argue that should start with ensuring that all those who work in hospitals are given adequate training, pay living wages, and good benefits so they can take care of themselves, their families, and effectively do their jobs. Secondly, we need a renewed focus on enhancing patient safety. Interested Americans who want to do more should check out the Safe Patient Care Campaign by the Consumers Union to learn more about how to get engaged and to make a difference on the patient safety front. Okay, Dan Zuberi is Associate Professor of Social Policy at the University of Toronto and the author of the new book called Cleaning Up, How Hospital Outsourcing is Hurting Workers and Endangering Patients. Scary stuff. Dan, thank you so much for your time with us today. Look forward to having you back sometime and talking more about this. Great. Thank you for having me. All right. And this is AmericasDemocrats.org, the weekly netcast for stand-up Democrats. We want you to sit back and listen, but we need you to stand up and fight. Help get our party back to its roots and to success at the ballot box. Make your contribution to Democrats for America's Future to keep this show on the air and help elect stand-up Democrats. Go to americasdemocrats.org and click on Donate at the top of the page. This is americasdemocrats.org, the weekly netcast for stand-up Democrats. And now, Bill Press and his guest, George Miller, one of the most progressive Democrats in Congress. Congressman George Miller joining us in the studio. Congressman, Good nice morning. to see you this Bill, morning. Thank you. How are you? Good. Good. You know, um, I am proud of the fact that uh, way, way back in your first run for political <laughs> office, when you were running for the state Senate, uh, Carol and I, right. young political, young political <laughs> activists from, from San Francisco, went across the bay to Point Richmond and right. walked precincts for uh, for George Miller. You went to the state senate, and now uh, and then on to uh, Congress, where you've been for forty years. Yes, yes. Uh, and this year, you announced you're stepping down. Why? It's been forty years. <laughs> it's been forty years. I've been flying back and forth across the country every weekend, and. Uh, I've had a great run. I love the job. I'm really proud of what I was able to uh, to accomplish. Um, but there's other things I'd like to do. I'd obviously like to continue to follow my passions with labor, with the environment, and, and certainly with uh, education, uh, but in a different form. It's been 40 years here. Yeah. What are you most proud of in the in the form? I mean, you, you have accomplished a lot, and I uh, I was proud to write a column about you and Henry Waxman yeah, this week, you. which yeah, I think are two of the, you know, two of the most effective uh, and successful members of Congress and, and hardest working that I've known. I think the American people yeah. have known. But of all of those things that you've done, what do you, what do you really most? Well, proud of? really, I, uh, you know, I started. I would say at the beginning of my career, I had an opportunity to write, uh, uh, which was, at that time was called Education for All Handicapped Children, which is now Individuals with Disabilities Education Act (IDEA). Uh, and when I first got here, along with Tom Harkin, and then at the end of my what I consider the end of my career, I was able to be one of the principal authors of the Affordable Care Act. And mm. uh, in 1974, when I was running, I ran on the National Health Care Plan and ending the war in Vietnam. And when 
I started thinking about leaving when I was at the signing ceremony in the White House when President Obama signed the Affordable Care Act. I thought, wow, I'm standing on top of Mount Everest here. There's, there's not much <laughs> up from here, you know. And and it just really sort of was – Yeah, that was a big event for me to have that That was a magic moment. I was there in the East Room. It was. Uh, with, it with was. Press so, you know, this, that day. this was a 100-year argument, and it looks like maybe we'll be, hung, we'll be arguing it now for another 110 years or something, but – uh, it was a big event, and it's a huge event for Americans' families. And do you think that uh, d- Democrats will, in 2014, will be able to go out and talk about the Affordable Care Act and, and, and run on it, or will they be running away from it? I think they can talk about it, and they'll be, they are able to talk about it in some very uh, almost conservative terms if they, if they want. They, this is about freedom. This is about families being able uh, to really follow their dreams, to, uh, to know that their kids are going to be taken care of. And it's about economic security. Never, ever again will you lose your health insurance if a traumatic event hits your family. And health in- right now, you know, health costs are the number one cause of bankruptcy because without this mm-hmm. insurance, people put it on their credit card, they can't manage it, and all of a sudden they're losing their home. And that just isn't going to happen anymore. So it's huge for economic security for families, for people who want to start a business, as the CBO report just uh, reports. It's going to allow people a lot of flexibility. Uh, if you have a child with a disability, maybe you, you want to work a few less hours, but if you work a few less hours, you're going to lose your health care. No, that won't happen to you in the future. So it's a big deal. It was uh, uh, unusual to see a, pre- the president, uh, a president of the United States uh, they always have their honored guests in the gallery uh, whom they recognize. But um, last Tuesday night, the president recognized two members of Congress who were sitting side by side, you and Senator Tom Harkin, on the issue of the minimum wage. I mean, that's you've been a champion of that, too, your entire career in Congress. Are we going to see some action this year? Yes, you are. You are. Uh, the The research now on the minimum wage is, is really spun completely around. We now see that it's very beneficial to communities. We see if you have a state where you have a higher minimum wage and a state where you have a lower minimum wage, the higher minimum wage, small businesses are hiring more people. Cities now are understanding you can't mm-hmm. have a thriving, vibrant city on the backs of poor people, uh, poor workers. Uh, and so they're raising the minimum wage. More money is on on, on uh on Main Street, these people have to spend this money because they're essentially low income, so they have to pay the doctor's bills. They have to, they have to you know, put gas in their car, groceries on their table, education supplies for their kids. So it really starts to change an economy, and, and, the, uh, uh, and that money generates that economic activity. In the old studies where it said, oh, this means everybody's going to lay it off and you're taking jobs from teenagers – well, the vast majority of minimum wage workers are over 20, and many of them are providing a major part of the wage in that family. Uh, so it's a different demographics, and I think American families that went through the Great Recession may have somebody with a college degree that's working at the minimum wage, and they're asking themselves, how can my son or daughter live on seven twenty-five an hour? Right. Well, you know, every, ever since um, I, my days with Jerry Brown, way, way yeah. back, right, uh, I've heard this argument. That if you raise a minimum wage, you know it's going to cost Americans jobs. We're going to lose all these jobs, and I still hear it's never been proven true, but I still hear it today from Speaker John Boehner. And so they're stuck in the past. I mean, they they they, they're just stuck in the past. Their conservative nature is, is. you know, hasn't allowed them to move forward and look at the new evidence and look at the economic studies and look at the cities that have increased the minimum wage. Seattle, San Francisco, San Diego, San Jose, just on the on the West Coast. You know, uh, New Jersey by initiative with the opposition of Governor Christie. People understand. People are making fifteen, twenty, thirty dollars an hour. Say, how the hell can you live on seven dollars and twenty five cents an hour? It's mm-hmm. just you can't do it. And they have, and there's that empathy. And that's why in the polls across all regions, across all parties, people support increasing the minimum wage. The Republicans are going to vote for it. They just don't know it yet, but they're going to vote for it. (laughs) (laughs) Well, good. Let's get that message out. Are you listening, John Boehner? He's probably down at Pete's Diner right now, right? Yeah, right. Yeah. I hope they've got the show on the air down there. So – it, it, I have to. I have to ask you about. I mean, you, you've you know the ratings, the, the poll ratings for members of Congress right now, and and you know that this 113th it looks like is going to be the the most do nothing Congress ever. It must be frustrating for somebody who wants to get things done like you. you know, it is. It is to be working uh, with these guys. But you know, uh, and and the problem is, the, you know, the actions of a few take everybody down. So the so the yeah, tea, the yeah. Tea Party can create gridlock. But like gridlock in traffic, if you're the if you're the 400th car down the street, you're still stuck. 
Yeah, you know, right. the guys are brawling in the middle of the intersection. You're still stuck. And and people are angry. They expect the Congress to respond to the needs of this country. They expect us, you know, we still can't get an infrastructure bill. There's no disagreement about how far we're falling behind in the basic physical in- infrastructure of this country and highways and roads and bridges and airports and ports for the new generation of ships and new generation of airplanes. And America's not there. Right. When you travel overseas, you just see what's going on in those areas. And you can see why people are shifting their 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 freight routes to different to different ports to you know to, uh, to not come to the United States in the new modern ships because we don't have ports that can receive them. Those are jobs. Those are not only construction jobs, but they're jobs in the increased activity. And and uh, so the Tea Party has decided that the, you know they've really convinced themselves that the government provides no value added. Therefore, if you get rid of it, nothing lost. You know, it's not a problem. It's just a denial of American history. Yeah. You know, the government has been a catalyst for basic fundamental research. Uh, if you look at the, new, the, the, the book, uh, The Entrepreneurial State, mm-hmm. uh, uh, Steve Jobs was a genius to create the iPhone. He created out of eight basic fundamental technologies that were funded by the Department of Defense, uh, Department of Commerce through DARPA and other federal agencies that he assembled and created the iPhone. That's the way it's supposed to work. We were the catalyst for defense that no company could afford to do. So how do you turn this Congress around? Well, I think, you know, well, I think... Maybe not this Congress, but Congress around. Well, I, I think... Because you were there today, yeah. if I could just... Well, you were there today when you may not have been in the, in, in the majority even. But there was an opportunity to get some things done because you could... You had people there who were in between elections, right, were focusing on problem solving. I spent a lot of years in the minority. I still got things done. I was able yeah. to work with, uh, I worked with John Boehner and George W. Bush to do uh, the mm-hmm. education reform of VSCA, No Child Left Behind. Uh, I was able to create national parks in California with Jerry Lewis. He was very much opposed to them, but you could still negotiate. You could figure out how to do this. Uh, over and over and again, Don Young and I introduced the largest bill to fund land and water conservation fund. Here's Don Young, as far right as you can get from Alaska, and George yeah. Miller from <laughs> from the San Francisco Bay Area, and we got the hook and bullet crowd, the the, the uh, uh, you know the wildlife groups, and 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 really preserving America's great natural assets. Today, they don't want any part of. It. They want to destroy it. They want to knock it all down. So what's the answer? Getting <laughs> Well, I think they're burning their I think they're they're uh, they're burning the franchise, they're destroying the brand. You see in some polls sixteen percent of the people identify with the Republican Party. Pollsters tell us when you mm-hmm. ask people are you Republican mm-hmm. or Democrat and they know what you are because they can see how you're registered. Repu- fewer and fewer Republicans are saying I'm a Republican yeah, when they answer right. the phone for the for to polling data. So uh the brand's taken a big hit. And uh uh, the country can't stand still, and I think more and more people are going to realize it. The Republicans have done nothing in the last in the last three years to do to, um, in creating jobs. They have done nothing, nothing. Right. And we also and now they're in a position. Excuse me, they're in right, a position yeah. where uh, you see Cantor says he wants to do something on education. He wants to do something on school choice. He wants to do something. And with the commentators who immediately read the legislation or the ideas of the press conference say, "Well, they want to appear like they care about families." That's a wonderful agenda. I want to appear that I care about families. Is that politics or do you really care about families? So their new agenda is let's appear like we're friendly to families. <laughs> yeah, and let's let's appear like we're reaching out to women and yeah, we're yeah. reaching out to minorities. Right. And yeah. We're right. yeah. Mm-hmm. Meanwhile, nothing has changed. Uh, a lion in the United States Congress, Congressman George Miller from Congress, uh, California's 11th Congressional District. Congressman George Miller in studio with us from California, and uh, we're going to bounce up to the state of Maine with uh, Congressman Michael Michaud at the top of the next hour here. Uh, man, we're honored today. I have a little caucus here, <laughs> progressive caucus. Uh, Peter? We're on Twitter at BP Show, at BP Show, and Philly Fan 99 wanted us to ask you, Congressman Miller, about Alpha House. Alpha House. Tell us about Alpha House. Well, one of the things when I was considering my retirement, I realized I've been married for 50 years, and for 40 years I've been living uh, in Washington, and 32 of those years I've been living with Chuck Schumer and Dick Durbin. Uh, <laughs> and so I thought maybe it was time to go home. It's been an adventure. We uh, we started out in a snowstorm. Of, uh, Congressman uh, Marty Russo from Chicago uh, couldn't drive home in a snowstorm, so he, he moved into my house, and, and he never left. Uh, I, <laughs> he started remodeling and insulating the house and doing all these things. Uh, and then uh, uh, 
uh, uh, uh, Leon Panetta uh, was oh, right. was one of the roommates, along with uh, Sam Gadenson from Connecticut at that oh, yeah. time. Uh, uh, and uh, you know we've had uh, we've had quite a, a group of people. Right now, it's uh, Senator Durbin from Illinois and Senator Schumer from uh, uh, from New York. And uh, we, we, you know it's it's been good. You know Washington is a, is a tough town, and it's it's nice to uh, be able to go back and maybe we only chat for ten or fifteen minutes. Uh, uh, we all are on different schedules. We're, we're, you know, we go home at different times uh, to our districts, and, and so it's really worked out uh, for that reason. But it's been a lot of fun, it's, and it's been a subject of a lot of jokes and a lot of... Uh, and, of course, you've generated your own TV show, right? Well, that's Alpha the theory, House but they Amazon. made it all Republicans. They can't possibly be having as much fun, and they're talking about all the wrong issues. But other than that, I guess it's a hell of a deal. <laughs> <laughs> Let's say a quick hello to uh, Stacy, Congressman. Stacy's calling from out in Chicago. Hi, Stacy. Hey, good morning. I just wanted to ask the congressman if uh, the newer Democrats had the same fire that he's had for, you know, like his productive career, you know, are they Hmm. a little too worried about re-election like the Republicans? Yeah, good well, question. Thanks, yeah. Stacey, for the call. You know, I thought a lot about that because I thought about my leaving. Not I, I, as I said, I don't believe in the indispensable man theory, but I thought, what's it mean for take all this years of experience and know how and leave? But I'll tell you what, one of the parts of the equation was uh, this freshman class and uh, this Democratic uh, freshman uh, have amazing life stories. They have amazing life experiences. A number of them have held elective office at the state legislative le- uh, uh, level or, or at, at local Local government. Uh, they're combat veterans. They've overcome really a lot of adversity uh, in, the, in their lives. Uh, and it's really exciting. And uh, as I was campaigning for them, uh, and then when they showed up in the, uh, uh, in, you know, on the, the first day of Congress to be sworn in, uh, mm-hmm. I feel really good. I feel really good about this caucus. They look like America. Uh, they have the experiences of so many Americans that my generation doesn't have. It's different. It's, it's, uh, but it, I think it's really good. It's and then really there's some good. of those I'm just thinking or, or, that, who've been there a little while, uh, earning their stripes. Keith Ellison, I mentioned, uh, co-chair sure. of, the, of yeah. the Progressive Caucus. Um, uh, I, I was thinking, you know, there's so many. Uh, Chris Van Hollen is a yes. frequent guest of ours. Uh, Jan Schakowsky from Chicago. There's, Absolutely, there's some firebrands. There's a left, lot huh? of talent here. There's yeah. a lot of talent. The problem is that the, you know, the, is that the Republicans Don under, Edwards uh, just thought un, of her. Under, yep. the, under the domination of the Tea Party will not open up the Congress for legislation because they either want it their way or no way, and you can't run this Congress that way. But. Uh, this is a pretty creative group of people in the Democratic caucus, and uh, we spend a lot of time figuring out uh, how, how, to, how to move them and move them on issues. And I think you're seeing that on some of the economic issues. I think you're clearly seeing that on the minimum wage. Uh, I think the Republicans are embarrassing themselves with uh, not extending uh, unemployment insurance to families that desperately need it, who are looking for work but can't find work. Uh, so uh, I'm, I'm, I'm op- very optimistic. And, of course, the, the, you know, the leadership of Nancy Pelosi is, is just unparalleled in a legislative body. Final question. Uh, you speak of Nancy Pelosi. She introduced a, a, con- a constitutional amendment yesterday to do something about finan- public financing for congressional uh, campaigns. How important is that? It's the most important thing uh, on, on the national agenda. If you don't get... What now the Supreme Court has allowed anonymous, unlimited money, dark money. If you don't get the dark money out of the campaigns, I don't know how you hold on. Because mm-hmm. people don't know what they're voting for or against or who they're voting for or against when anonymous money shows up. The candidate's interesting in a congressional seat. But if that candidate has lost control yeah. of their campaign and this money now can overwhelm all of the money you can raise in your district. All of the money you can raise in your district that people give to you in, in $50 checks, $100, $250, maybe $1,000, your opponent now opens up with four or $500,000 in media, and it yeah. just keeps happening, and it doesn't matter what the people in the district think because they just swamp their ability to have their voices heard. This is the most dangerous threat, I think, to our democracy. I mean, the Chinese are interesting, and the Russians are interesting. A lot of things are interesting. This one's internal, and it's destroying uh, people's participation and, and local voices being heard about their representatives in the Congress of the United States. And uh, Leader Pelosi is right. And John Sarbanes has done a huge amount of work on this right. from, from uh, Maryland. Mm-hmm. Uh, you're going to have to go to a constitutional amendment because every court has sort of protected the rights of rich people to influence elections. But this one went way overboard, even wiping out disclosure. I think 
The Congress can do the disclosure, but the, but the limits will be more difficult. Congressman, thank you for uh, such great service to uh, all Americans for our country. We all live better because of your good work. Oh, that's so very much, nice. Thank you so much, Bill. Right, thanks for coming in. That's all for AmericasDemocrats.org. Thank you to all who made today's show possible. David K. Johnston, Dan Zuberi, and the entire Bill Press team. And thank you for listening. If you liked what you heard, please get involved in our efforts to keep this show going and to elect Democrats who are bringing the party back to its roots. Go to americasdemocrats.org and click on Donate at the top of the page. And be sure to find 21st Century Democrats on Facebook. For americasdemocrats.org, I'm your host, Jim Cuddy. We want you to sit back and listen, but we need you to stand up and fight. Join us, support the show, and help elect Democrats who will stand up for democratic principles with your contribution today. Go to a.